All right, folks, I want to welcome our guest to the show. It is the creator and curator of the Sasquatch Archives, Todd Prescott. Welcome to the show, Todd. Thanks for having me on, Brian. I have been uh, looking forward to this, man. We we were talking uh, a little bit before we went on the air, and the Sasquatch Archives is one of my favorite places for information on the web when it comes to Bigfoot Sasquatch. So before we get started with anything, I want to say thank you for putting that together, and we'll certainly get into how that came about. But I like to start in the place where I start with most people. When you talk about Sasquatch, everybody has a story about what got them interested in the subject and what got them into this thing in the first place. So if you wouldn't mind, let's start there and tell the audience what that was for you. Yeah, I think my story is pretty mundane. It's uh, probably fairly typical, you know, young boy, uh, the world's a big place and someone, uh, someone talks about hairy monsters or you see it on TV or in a magazine or a book. In my case, it was mostly in books. I was a, a bookworm and uh, probably at age eight or nine in school, hit, found the zero hundreds in the, uh, the school library. And uh, this was back in the 70s. So we had a really good collection of UFO stuff, um, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, Stonehenge, all the mysteries of the universe. and um, that really hooked me. I, 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 and for some reason, I really gravitated towards Sasquatch, Bigfoot, the Yeti. Um, and then from there, you know, I would see documentaries on TV and, and then, of course, magazine articles as well. Uh, when you're a kid, the library has magazines like Omni and there would be articles in there. Um, and, and it just one thing led to the other. And um, I got hooked at a young age. And also where I grew up, Brian, it was a little tiny village of 350 people, believe it or not. We had well water, it came from a tap, but we had well water. So we didn't have a lot to do. And uh, I guess also living on the edge of forest, like my backyard was literally a forest. It was intriguing. It wasn't a huge forest, but it kind of led to other forests. Um, and it just seemed like a mysterious place. And it maybe could have had Bigfoot in my mind. Although I know now it didn't because it probably wasn't big enough. But, you know, let, let your imagination run wild. And it did. Um, but then I started taking it serious um, in my mid to late teens because now you're free. You have your license. You can drive. And, of course, I had read John Green's books and Rene de Hinden's book. And I remember John Green talking about Ontario and talking about specifically a place up north um, where something called Old Yellowtop uh, had been sighted from the early 1900s in a place called Cobalt, which was a mining town. And in looking on maps, I realized it was maybe five or six hours north of me. So I thought that's within reach. But then I also noticed that there was mention of sightings closer to me in the Niagara um, region. So, you know, New York has Niagara Falls and so does Canada. Um, and so I, I, I eventually started going out and following up on stuff and just traipsing through the woods, seeing what I could find. Um, yeah. So that's, that's how it all got started. Really. Uh, it, it, it morphed into many other things eventually, but like, like most uh, young children, it was my imagination that, that fired it up for sure. Well, what was the first thing for you? Was it hitting the woods? Were you more interested in documenting other people's encounters and talking to people who had had potential encounters with these things? What was it for you? Uh, honestly, for me, it was hitting the woods, having grown up on the edge of the forest and spending so much of my youth in the woods. I wanted to be out there doing it. Um, and truly the reports that I was reading about, they had long since like it was years ago. So they'd all passed. There was trying to find someone in that day and age without the internet. It was, it was virtually impossible. You might have a first name, rarely a last name, and yeah, so I would just go into the area because I was kind of chasing ambulances, looking, looking for, you know, evidence, thinking I might encounter one since it had been sighted there 40 years ago. Maybe, maybe by chance, uh, you know, it's still lingering around. Who knows? Um, so, yeah, for me, it was it was just getting out in the woods because I love the woods. Very comfortable in the woods. Um, you know, I don't know what the expression is, but I've, I've got the green thumb of the woods, so to speak. Uh and it wasn't until much later, much, much later that 
I really started documenting stuff. For me, it was just, it was just, you know, fun. It was, it was exciting. It was, it was dangerous. Uh, it was intriguing. Um, that was, that was the appeal and the allure was uh, just, just wondering, could, could these things be out there? Um, might I run into one? Might I see one? And of course, with that, you, you see other things too, that you wouldn't normally see um, if you're not out in the woods. So it was, it was sort of fulsome because it satiated my desire to be in the woods and also my desire to, you know, explore the unknown and, and maybe have a chance encounter. But yeah, I wasn't really following up particularly with witnesses as much as following up in the areas of sightings. Well, eventually all of that led to, I know you've had contact or had contact with some of the earlier well-known researchers in Bigfoot, some of the four horsemen of Sasquatchery, if you will. What led you down that path? How did you run into people like John Green and Renee DeHendon and those folks? What led you down that road and how did that happen? Uh, well, it's funny because I was just doing everything on my own. Um, growing up in a village so small, there weren't a lot of people to hang out with. And you got to imagine 350 people. I, I had one close friend who was two years younger than me, which wasn't cool to hang out with someone younger, but it, there weren't many options. And he most certainly wasn't interested in Sasquatch. <laughs> so so I, I, I had to really do it all on my own. And then, you know, as I went into my teens and, and was mobile with, with dad's car, um, I was able to go out and, and, and do more searching rather than just locally. Um, but luck, luck played a big factor in my growth as a Sasquatch researcher because I'm a musician. And I, I managed to land a really good gig with a touring band who was touring around the province of Ontario. And we actually went to a lot of the areas uh, mentioned in books and newspaper articles. So I found myself um, in Cobalt, Ontario, the home of old Yellow Top, who had been sighted for decades upon decades. So I was able to stop in there and, and, and look around and other places too, like North Bay, where a guy had a sighting of, of a Sasquatch picking berries. And then even further north, uh, where you get into some of the indigenous um, communities where you just ask and they'll talk all about what's happening um, more openly than some people um, realize, depending, I guess, on your approach um, and demeanor. But they were always very welcoming to me and, and quite open about things. And so with with the band, it, it ultimately led to another band um, in British Columbia and for those who don't know, of course, British Columbia is kind of the mecca of Sasquatch research activity and, and whatnot. And it's the uh, the most westerly province in Canada. So it it's on the Pacific Ocean and, of course, has the Coast Mountains and the Rocky Mountains. And it's just a, a beautiful place. And that, of course, is where John Green was born and raised. And Rene DeHinden showed up there in 1953. Uh, Bob Titmus made it his home eventually. So two of the uh, four horsemen lived there. And it was 1995 when I got a call to potentially join a band that was looking for a drummer. Some some guys I went to college with, uh, a music school here in Toronto. They, uh, they made their way out west. And I don't think they knew my interest in Sasquatch. But when, when they, they called and said, we really need a drummer. How about you come out? I said, I'm, I'm there now. Like I'm, I'm, I'm packing up my car. And I literally drove, I drove across Canada and got to see a lot of this beautiful country and ended up out there for a good solid year um, until the band fell apart because the singer and the guitar player were married and things happened. And uh, so it didn't last very long as much, as long as I wanted it to. And I really wanted to stay out there, but things just didn't work out with what was going on in my life. But when I was out there, of course, I knew that Rene DeHinden and John Green were there. Um, so there were times we had days off. We, we worked mostly Thursday to Saturday or Wednesday to Saturday. So I had my other three, four days off a week. So I would literally hit all the hot spots um, in Harrison Hot Springs, where John Green uh, ended up living for many years, um, was there in Harrison uh, back in 1995. So I stopped in with the intent 
of going to the phone booth. Remember, this is 1995. I don't think anyone had a cell phone. If they did, it would have been one of those ones on the on, on your car. Uh, so I, 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 I literally went to a phone booth, booth and opened up the pages the, of the phone book, found his name. It was there, John Green, and uh, put my whatever it was, a dime or a quarter. I can't remember, probably a quarter at that time. Put a quarter in and I dialed his number. I think the phone rang twice. And then I hear a voice. Hello. It was clearly an old man. And I just literally, I freaked out. I got spooked. And all of a sudden I just, I was starstruck and I just hung up. I just couldn't follow through with it. I don't know what overcame me. My intent was to talk to him, but I was just freaked out that I, and, and all of a sudden I thought I shouldn't be bothering this guy. You know, he's, he's got so many years invested. Here I am, little Todd Prescott from Ontario, basically knocking on his door. I, I don't know. It just, it, it's just all of a sudden, it's weird because I fully intended to talk to this guy, but I just chickened right out. And that's not like me. And I don't know why, I guess the stars were not aligned that, that moment. And someone said, or something said, hang up, it'll come later. So what came later though, was talking to Renee DeHinden. Now I had moved back to Ontario in 96 and was resettling because of what had happened out West. So I starting again, trying to get, you know, uh, everything happening with music, realize with music, once you leave, you know, your area and go somewhere else, you've lost all your gigs and they're left behind and you got to start again because someone else has swooped in to take your gigs. So it was like starting fresh. I didn't have a car and being a drummer without a car is a nightmare. And no one wants to pick up the drummer. Um, so I did some odd jobs, continue to research, uh, do a lot of uh, field researching. And at this time, there was a little more information available and some other sightings started popping up and VFRO, I think had started around that time. And uh, so there were some reports there, the Gulf coast research group as well. Uh, we're posting some Ontario reports. Um, but it was really in 97 when I thought I need to get back to BC. It's calling me. I just love this province. I got to get back to it. And I wanted to do um, like a, like a solo expedition. So I was, caught between um, Bella Coola and or the Queen Charlotte Islands were the two main places I was going to check out. And I settled on Bella Coola. And the reason was because Rene de Hinden and a guy named Don Hunter had authored a book um, in the early 70s called Sasquatch. And you might remember it has a yellow cover with that famous Patterson Gimlin film frame on it. And in the first few pages, um, I think it's the first few pages, he mentions uh, Bella Coola. And for some reason, that, that name stuck out. And I thought, Bella Coola, that sounds beautiful, Bella Coola. Um, and I looked on a map and saw where it was, and I thought, wow, it's pretty remote. And basically, Rene said that of all the places in his opinion where you would have an encounter like the odds would be greatest to have an encounter. It would be Bella Coola, British Columbia. So I thought, hmm, if Renee's going to say that, there must be something to it. So I started uh, researching as much as I could through encyclopedias and books and uh, settled on going to Bella Coola. Now, before I went there, I called Renee because I had written his number down. Um, I found his number. He was living in Richmond, British Columbia. So I, I, I had traveled, uh, I was doing a gig in Richmond. And I looked up, same as I did with John Green, went to a phone booth, but I didn't want to call Renee. I wasn't, after I got spooked with, with John, I'm like, I'm not going to do that again, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep his number. So I found his number, wrote it down in my little address book. And uh, finally in 97, I called him, I guess it was early May because I was in Bella Coola in mid-May. And I wanted to just talk to him and, and, and mention I was going to Bella Coola did he have any advice? So here this, this grumpy old man answers the phone with his Swiss accent. And uh, he was he was quite gruff and jaded. And I mean, he was pretty ticked off at the world at that time. Uh, so, but I was talking to Rene DeHinden, right? That's the first researcher I really had talked to because I hung up on John Green. So I'm talking to Rene. Uh, and he basically gave me a little bit of advice, um, nothing earth shattering, but basically, you know, take a video camera, 
um, which I had, and I was really good at using my video camera. I had a decent one at the time. And he also talked about the Patterson Gimlin film, um, but he was very, um, very jaded. He wasn't happy. And, and honestly, he left me, I've said this before, he's left me, he left me with a bad taste in my mouth because he wasn't the friendliest guy. And I had said to him, Renee, I would love to take you out for lunch after my Bella Coola trip. So my, I was supposed to be in Bella Coola, deep in the mountains, because Bella Coola is like a, an indigenous community. And then on the other side of the Bella Coola River are the mountains. And they're coastal mountains. And they're rugged. And there's a long history of Sasquatch sightings in the area. So I just wanted to go in solo. It was quite foolish, now that I think of it. Just go into Bella Coola, the mountains, and have that encounter that Renee says you're going to have. It's, you know, my chances are greatest to have an encounter there. So that's the place I'm going to go. And I had a lot of experience camping and hiking, so I felt pretty confident. But I had never hiked to that extent in the province of British Columbia. I was used to Ontario, which is a relatively flat province, at least in my area. So I, I was in way over my head. Um, but I'll never forget, I had to fly into Vancouver from Toronto, which is a five-hour flight. And then I had to charter a plane up to Bella Coola. Because the only other option was going by sea, which would have taken a while, or driving, which would have taken forever. So I opted to charter a plane. And I think it was an hour flight from Vancouver to Bella Coola. For those who don't know, Bella Coola is halfway up the coast, halfway up the province of British Columbia. And it's almost on the coast, a little bit in from the coast. Just a beautiful area. Magical. Just you feel the power when you're there. So... I get there, you know, I'm, I'm checking out the community. It's, there's not much there. I know I have to get across the river. I didn't know anyone there. So I thought I could pay someone to float me across the river. So there I am waiting at the river for someone to see me with my backpack. And sure enough, this old timer, uh, native guy comes walking over. He's like, Hey there. I'm like, Oh, Hey, how are you? My name's Todd. He says, Oh, I, I'm the chief of Baracula. I said, Oh, nice to meet you. And, and he was, like, I, I looked it up later on. He was the chief. He thought, who's this white boy standing on the, the shores here with the backpack? What's, what's he doing? So I talked to him, and he was very curious. And I didn't want to broach the subject of Sasquatch just yet. So I tried to warm up to him, and he was telling me some, some history about Bella Coola. And I, I basically said I wanted to get to the other side of the river to do a vision quest, Right. I, I was working pretty hard in Ontario, feeling the stress, just wanted to get the stress off my back and, and experience what it has to offer. So he said, oh, you know, um, our village used to be across the river, but it used to flood. So we moved the whole village over here on this side that you're standing on, which is quite a huge undertaking. Um, and there's photos of that where they moved the whole village. So I thought, you know, this I'm going to segue into Sasquatch now because he seems to be taking to me. He's uh He's warmed up to me. So I said, uh, you know, I've read, I've read about some Sasquatch reports in the area. And he said, he kind of paused and he said, yes. Um, but I, he, he said that he thought they moved out of the area with all the logging. He said though, there's another creature called Snenik. And that's how he said it with a sort of Snenik, um, who resembles Sasquatch, but is more of a, a quadruped. So, more on four legs, uh, a little more aggressive too. He said they're still and smaller. They're still around, so you might see one of those. And he and he he pointed across the river and said, "You're going to have a lot of stuff happen over there because there's spirits, you know, the spirits of our ancestors, this and that." Um, and I had brought tobacco. I had brought some gifts, you know, to leave um, when I when I went over there, and I made him aware of that. So I think he respected that that I was going to honor the land. Um, and then he said, so you need to get over to cross the river. So I'll, I'll get my nephew and he'll float you across. So his nephew shows up and floated me across. So that, that began my venture in Bella Coola, at least in the mountains. So I get floated across and I said to him, come back in a month, come back on this specific day. I'll be here. And if I'm not, there's a problem, right? <laughs> Cause this is, this is before cell phones. I'm going in with nothing. I'm, I'm, there's, I'm just going in, but I, you know, I'd let the, uh, the local authorities know, um, like the forest ranger of a, of, a, of a major park that was close by, a national park, 
or rather provincial park, let my parents know, like, here's where I'm going to go. I'm going to follow this old logging road. I'm going to get to this other river. I'm going to use the bridge to get across. Well, of course, the map I was using, the topo map, was from 1958. So things change. And uh, I've got this map. And I didn't know how to waterproof it, so I, I literally used scotch tape. Just put, like, some, some like uh, uh, I guess, packing tape over top of it to keep it waterproof, knowing that it rains there a lot. I didn't realize that it rains there every day. And I mean, I was prepared to a certain extent, but anyways, I start my trek and I've got 60 pounds on my back. I've got 25 pounds on my front. So I've got a front pack and a backpack because I'm carting food. Uh, you know, I've, I've got, I've got my pots and pans. Uh, I've got, I've got essentials for a month. It's, it's four weeks. It's a long time. I was sort of banking on, on, on some wild edibles. I wasn't going to do any hunting, but just wild edibles. Uh, I thought, when I lived in BC, I noticed that their season was ahead of Ontario. So I was looking forward to berries and some, some succulents, uh, big mistake because in the mountains, things slow down. Uh, there was nothing I could eat really other than some thistle, which was not tasty. Anyhow, I start trekking and within 30 feet, I see the biggest pile of bear dung, huge pile. It was just massive. And I've seen lots of bear in Ontario. I've seen their piles of dung. This was insanely huge. I'm going, Holy crap. I did not expect that. Well, unbeknownst to me, this is an area of Canada where bee, where uh, black bears and grizzly bears converge. They, sh they share the same area. Had I known there were grizzly bears there, I wouldn't have gone, honestly. Uh, I'm, I'm used to black bears, but grizzly bears, that's a different level. Anywho, um, I'll cut to the chase here. Long story short, I spent only two weeks in the forest of Bella Coola. Never saw a Sasquatch. Had the living daylight scared out of me a few times um, with what I thought was a a bear encounter. I thought it was, I thought it was a baby bear, but it turned out to be a grouse that was screaming like a like a baby bear. And I was just waiting for Mama to come flying out of the woods at me. So that made my heart stop. Had a moose walk up to my tent one morning, um, and then I had a very treacherous river crossing when I realized the bridge had washed out. That bridge that was there in '58, lo and behold, wasn't there in 1997. So I had a very treacherous river crossing because I had to get to the other side to continue my my trek. And when I got to the other side, I realized that even the trail had overgrown. I couldn't find the trail. I managed to get back maybe a mile or two. After that, uh, I wasn't going anywhere unless I wanted to get lost. Um, so I, I, I doubled back, came back on the river, and just laid in the area for two weeks. And it was scary. I felt like a rabbit. You don't know how vulnerable you are until you're out in the elements and nature's in control. And one night, uh, I thought I'd eaten something called cleavers. Whatever it was gave me a fever. I thought I was going to die. I broke out in a fever. Uh, and that same night, a huge thunderstorm, lightning storm. Lightning struck a tree, one of those big Douglas firs. Sounded like it was beside my tent. I thought it was coming down on my tent because it came crashing down. Uh, so I thought it was a goner. But uh, anyways, I woke up in the morning. Fever had broke. Um, and the tree had landed hundreds of feet away. But it sounded like it was coming right at me. So um, that was Bella Coola. Now... Again, remember, I had talked to Rene de Hinden before going to Bellacoola, and the plan was to call him when I came out and to take him out for lunch or dinner. So I get back to civilization, spent a little time in Bellacoola, talked to some more people who had who had sightings. And again, they kept mentioning this creature called Snenik. And uh, later on, I did some investigations on Snenik. And it's, it's truly uh, another you know, another Bigfoot type creature, according to the people of Bella Coola. Um, just a little different, but they see those more than they see Sasquatch apparently nowadays. Um, and I get back to Vancouver and I was hanging out with some old, some of the old band guys that, you know, were, were still there lingering. And I thought, I got to call Rene DeHinden. But I thought, I don't want to talk to that guy. He was so grumpy. It wasn't fun talking to him. Honestly, he just wasn't, I, that wasn't my vibe. I just come out of my vision quest. I felt so relaxed. I felt purified. And I, I just don't want to hear him, you know, going on about this and that. So I didn't, I didn't bother. I wish I had of, but I didn't, I, I didn't do the follow-up call and I do regret it because I only talked to him that one time and uh, that was it. So, uh, uh, you know, my, my time in BC is, is, is done. I'm back in Ontario. And again, I'm just following up on reports, 
uh, here and there when I can. The internet has taken off now. So there's, you know, this, it's all blowing up and there's uh, so many reports to do um, and to follow up on. And at that time I started getting involved with the, at the BFRO um, mostly because it gave you access like to reports that were fairly fresh. Um, and I did that for a while. Now I'll, I'll, I'll get into how I ultimately met up with John Green many years after the fact, I guess using some advanced math, 15 years, no, uh, 17 years after the fact. So 95 was when I meant to call him when I was basically on his doorstep. And then it wasn't until 2012 <clears throat> when I actually met him. But how that came about was I was working on a book series on Bigfoot researchers since around 2010. And I had collected hundreds and hundreds of names of old researchers, current researchers, researchers who had passed on. And, you know, I had them all listed out on my computer, still do. And I was contacting people, Peter Byrne, John Green, Chris Murphy, Larry Lund, a who's who of, of Sasquatch research. I was reaching out to them via email and I kept, I kept, emailing John Green, asking him, hey, do you mind looking up in your files some information about so-and-so because I just read about them. I don't have any information. There's nothing online, but maybe you have a letter from the dude. And, he, and finally, he just got fed up and said, listen, Prescott, I can't keep doing your research for you. You know, and he, and he said it in a nice way. And I would talk to him on the phone, too, because at, at that time, uh, you know, he had changed numbers, but, but, but I had his number. And so, yeah, he said, you got to come out here and do your own research. And he, and he said it in a joking way, but, but John Green was very serious too. He was half joking, half serious. Um, but I, I got the point. Stop bugging me. I'm an old man. Do your homework. I can't keep bending down going through my files. So I took that as an offer and I booked a time off from work and I flew out to where he was living, which was Agassiz, which is very close to Harrison Hot Springs, little community, quite nice. And he was living in a like a retirement community, old age home. At that time, he was in his mid eighties. Um, but man, that guy was spry. Holy geez. So I'll, I'll never forget. I show up and I uh, get into the home where he's living and you know, there's a lot of residents and they're kind of looking now, who's this, who's this young guy coming in? Right. And, uh, Oh, I don't know. And they're elbowing each other. Who's this guy? Like I'm, I'm the, I'm the new news. Right. And, uh, John Green was in whatever apartment 14 or something. I don't know. Knock on the door, knock, knock. I hear these, these feet sort of shuffling towards the door and then the door opens and I said, Oh, hi, John. I'm, I'm Todd Prescott. Hello, Todd. I go, this is a really nice retirement community. And he, and he pauses and looks me straight in the eye and says, what's nice about it. We're all dying here. I'm like, oh, my God, how do you respond to that? And I said, oh, well, well, nice to meet you. And he said, well, come on in. And he basically, no small talk, just the files are in that room. Help yourself to anything. And then he just went in, into the TV room, sat down, got the newspaper out, continued reading. And I sat in there for a good six hours. Uh, and I came out to just say hello and tell him how things were going. And he was still reading his newspaper and he put his glasses down and looked at me and said, I'm glad you're here. He was lonely because his wife had passed away. He was very lonely. Um, so I, I feel good that that maybe I brightened up his, his time when he was there because I was there, I'm going to say for five days straight on that visit. And now realize that I didn't know the extent of his collection. I'd heard rumors, but his collection, it was literally... I think it was three filing cabinets, like, like, you know, big filing cabinets you see in office buildings, chock full of letters, communications dating back to, I think, 55 um, and, and handwritten letters, typed letters right up until I think the last one was 2011. He was writing a guy named Wayne King, um, who was an old Michigan researcher. Uh and, and, and Green had, he, he followed my letters too, because I was writing them as well. So I was like, oh, my letters, are, that's pretty cool. But I was a minnow in, in the big C because there were so many people. 
And I, I right away went to, you know, the, the Grover Krantz file, the Peter Byrne file, the Bob Titmus file, the Rene DeHinden file. And I just went through those. And I, again, I didn't know how much stuff he had. So I wasn't prepared. I had a notebook and a pen. I didn't have a scanner. Uh, I had a really crappy cell phone that the pictures wouldn't have been worth taking. So I, I, I just took notes. And I, if I'm not mistaken, the first day I was there, I only got halfway through the Grover Krantz file because there's hundreds of letters and you have to read them to see what's in there. And I went, oh my God, this is overwhelming. I'm not going to get this done in five days. I didn't know what I was getting into. So I, I, I was there for five days and eventually John said, hey, join me for lunch. I'll pay. I'm like, oh, wow, uh, that's okay. I'll pay, John. No, no, it's on me. Join me for supper. I'll pay. Let's go for a walk. Let's talk. So it was amazing because here I am in the company of, you know, one of the grandfathers of Sasquatch research, uh, the guy who really put the subject on the map. And I'm sitting in his home and I'm going through his files. It was surreal. I was, I was living history, reliving history. And then these walks, I couldn't keep up with the guy. He was just ripping down the, down through these fields. I'm going, holy geez, man. And he had a bad foot. But he was just always in a hurry. Um, and every now and then he would just come in and see what, what, what I was doing, kind of look at what file I'm going through. And then he'd you know, interject and, and talk about what, what was going on in the letter. The, the guy's memory was pretty sharp at that time. There were some things he had forgotten, but it was amazing. Once you showed him something, he would remember it. And then he showed me his, his slide collection, his negatives, his photos. And they said, oh, I've got these cassettes uh, uh, recorded of interviews. You might be interested in those. I'm like, oh, my God. So my five days were up, and I said, John, I hate to leave, but I have to go back to work. I would love to come back at some point and scan this stuff. It needs to be archived and saved digitally because it's vulnerable. It's paper. And he said, oh, I don't think it's that important. You know, no one no one really cares about this stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's not important. I'm John, this stuff is really important. This is, this is history. Whether Sasquatch is ever found or not, this is of cultural importance, right? And he said, oh, I don't think so. You know, it's just going to get trashed when I'm gone. And I'm thinking, John, no, like seriously, really think about it. Really think about this. This is important. If I'm here doing what I'm doing, it's important to me. And I know important to others too. And I said my goodbyes. Um, and he had said, though, you can come back because you didn't finish. So I had I had planned a month later to come back, but this time for, I think, eight days. So I came back. And this time when he greeted me at the door, he was more cheery. And he said, you know, Todd, I, I thought about what you said about scanning it. You're welcome to scan it. And I had brought a scanner this time. So so I was prepared. Um, it was only a little tiny hand uh, wand scanner. It wasn't good enough, so I had to go in, into Vancouver, drive an hour and a half away and get a real scanner at one of those Best Buys. Uh, but then I started scanning stuff, and it was literally from 9 a.m. in the morning after breakfast because John woke up early. We'd go have breakfast, his treat, and, and I got to meet all his friends. And he'd talk about you know, the old days, Sasquatch stuff. And everyone in the place knew he was a Sasquatch researcher. John Green was also the mayor for a while of Harrison Hot Spring. So he was kind of a celebrity there in his own right. Uh, so I would I would scan literally from 9 a.m. with a break here and there till whenever John went to sleep. Sometimes he sl stayed up till 11 o'clock at night. Sometimes he went to bed at 8:30, and I'd stop scanning because it's kind of loud, you know. Zzz. And uh, there are a few times where I, I snuck in scanning because I wanted to get something done and never woke him up. But I had thou I have thousands and thousands and thousands of files. You got to figure most letters aren't just one page. There are three or four pages, sometimes some some of them are nine or nine to twelve pages. So each each page has to be has to be scanned. I scanned all the photos that he gave me to look at, all the negatives, um, all the slides that he gave me. I made cassette recordings of his cassette recordings, so I dubbed those. Thank God he had a, a, a dual cassette player recorder, which was great. But finding blank cassettes in Agassiz. British Columbia was not easy. <laughs> um, so 
and after after I did that, I, I'm sitting on all these files, thousands upon thousands, and photos. I've got to go through it all because when I'm scanning them, I'm not reading them. I'm just put the sheet on the scanner, get the next one ready, and it's just it's a factory. I actually have a video of me doing it. It's nuts. It's just nonstop, literally for eight hours, ten hours, sometimes twelve hours, and. <clears throat> I get home and I'm going, wow, that was a lot. So I was at John's, John's place three times. So there are three different visits. And then a fourth visit was he had moved, but I just dropped in to say hello, see how he was doing. Cause his health had really um, uh, went south at that point. So it was almost like saying goodbye. Um, and it was on my way to Beachfoot with Chris Murphy and Thomas Steenberg uh, carpooling down there. So I stopped in to see John. And shortly after there, he passed away. But um, back back home, I'm, I'm, I'm literally reading every single letter from start to finish. I'm summarizing every single letter from start to finish. Just, just a, a basic summary of what the letter's about. And then I indexed every single letter. So if if someone mentions Bella Kula, I, I, you know, I index that. And it took me three years. No word of lie. It took me three years to go through everything, to summarize, index, file it properly, organize it, and all the photos as well. So it was a huge undertaking. And then I thought to myself, this stuff needs to be shared. And John said, share. If it's mine, you can share it. If it's not my photo, I can't tell you you can share it. But if I have it, it's probably mine. There were some stuff that he had that wasn't really his, but um, a lot of people have passed on. But uh, yeah, so I started sharing it on YouTube, a little bit of the stuff, some of the, the stuff that would be most interesting that hadn't seen the light of day, some old letters and things like that. And I thought, well, I've got to come up with a, a name. So I called it my YouTube channel, The Sasquatch Archives, and just started sharing stuff there, um, realizing that there's just too much to share, but I'll get out the stuff that people are most interested in. And there was one thing that I had I'd never seen anywhere other than a transcription of it on Bobby Short's uh, Bigfoot Encounters website. Um, it was an interview with Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin on October 26th, 1967. So five days after, um, or six days after the Patterson-Gimlin film, um, they went to show the film in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia to scientists. And they were interviewed following the showing so their recollection of the events is very fresh and a lot of people for some reason believe that they were in bluff creek for three weeks they weren't they were there for about a week and a half so nine or ten days and and roger talks about that in that interview and it's also captured in other interviews a little later somewhere along the line someone came up with a three-week timeline and Bob Gimlin has been saying that in his presentations, but it's actually not true uh, because you want to go to the earliest uh, recollections and recalls of the events. And, 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 and even early magazine articles are talking about a nine to 10 days. Even John Green's book, he talks about in this um, Sasquatch, the Apes Among Us, he talks about it being nine days. I don't know when it happened, but just for all you aficionados out there, it's, it's uh, not three weeks. It's nine to 10 days. They were in Bluff Creek, which makes sense because they had, they had horses with them. What are you going to feed the horses? What are you going to eat for three weeks? That's a long time to be out there. So it was a week and a half. And how, how, how did anyone get that much time off from work? That's or from the family. That's a long time to be away. What wife in the right mind would let their man go away, their husband for three weeks into Bluff Creek. Anywho. Um, so I put that John Green had that interview. He had that interview. He had the audio of that interview. It had never seen the light of day. I think some people had it, but I guess no one had the means to transfer it, um, make it digital, put it up on YouTube. So I asked John, hey, can I can I put this up on on uh, on the Internet? Well, maybe you should run it by Patricia Patterson. I'm like, ah, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm not going to call it Patricia. She's she's old, too. Um, I, I this this it, it she wouldn't have the copyright. It's a radio station. So I tried to track down the radio station. No one knew anything about it. And really, it wasn't the full interview. There's still half or a, par a portion of the interview is missing. 
John only had 20 minutes of the interview. So I put that up and uh, it got a lot of traction. And then from there, other things like Fred Beck being interviewed audio by Roger Patterson. So there's some stuff up there that's pretty unique and cool. And then ultimately other people came into the fold, such as Larry Lund um, through a guy named Gene Robinson, who has sent me hordes of stuff, old videotapes, mostly 90s stuff, but there's other stuff in there too from the past. So I have to, you know, thank Larry, thank Gene Robinson. There's a bunch of people who have been instrumental in helping out um, with the Sasquatch archives, um, at least giving permission to use stuff. So that's the Sasquatch archives uh, in a nutshell and how, how things led up to the Sasquatch archives. So that's where we are now. I know there's a lot there, but is there anything outside of maybe the Patterson Gimlin interview five or six days after the fact, was there anything that shocked you or really stood out to you that you went through during your time of processing all this information that he had stored? Maybe it was just something that you didn't believe or wouldn't have believed he would have kept, or maybe a piece of evidence or a photo or something that you saw. Was there anything that really stuck out and maybe surprised you? Um, there were a few things that, that, stood out and 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 maybe at least one or two that surprised me one one thing that surprised me was john green absolutely detested peter byrne just hated him um i have my theories as to why that is and of course you know john green basically thought that peter wasn't an honest man let's say and later on in life, Peter did run into some trouble with uh, with with legal issues, let's say. Um, but I was surprised because John didn't didn't trash talk anyone else. He seemed to be OK with everyone else, including people like Eric Beckjord, who was the bane of of researchers existence back then. Everyone loathed that guy. John Green. I, and I asked him flat out, I said, John. Why were you continuing your communications with Eric Beckjord, knowing that he's delusional and not all there and, and harassing people at three in the morning and making death threats? And John said, he never did that to me. He called me once at three in the morning. I said, don't ever do that again. And he never did it again. I got along with the guy. I didn't have a problem with him. Just because I was writing him letters doesn't mean I agreed with him. I found him to have fairly intelligent things to say but I didn't agree with everything. Uh, but Peter Byrne, oh my God, mentioned that name. And wow, John was, all the, the fangs came out and the horns came up. I mean, John, John Green put together a, a, like, a, like a little booklet all about Byrne and, and, and how he was a fraud and this and that. And he called it, I can't remember now, like Peter and the Wolf or something. And it was a play on that whole thing. And he, he, he mailed it out to people. He just detested Peter Byrne. And it was shocking because, I mean, I knew, but I didn't know to what extent. He just did not like Peter Byrne. But he got along with everyone else. He, and people that you would never imagine he'd get along with. Even Rene DeHinden, who wrote John some horrible letters. For many years, Rene just was not a nice man. And some people wonder if it was because... He was dealing with lead. He was he was um, excavating lead, the lead shot from the gun club. And maybe he was suffering from, from lead poisoning and it, and it messed up his mind a little bit. Because he was a nice guy in the early days. You can hear him on old interviews from 57, 58. He was a super nice kid. But somewhere along the way, he became very jaded and, and, and grumpy and, and just, uh, just a, almost like an ugly guy. And you can see that in some of the videos that I have. He's just, he doesn't agree with anyone. Um, he's always right. Um, but I mean, it's not fair to talk behind his back when he's not alive to defend himself. But he was a gruff man. Let's put it that way. He was gruff, very opinionated. And that's fine. But John, like Rene would write him a letter. I'm going to F and sue you. You know, you won't have money to feed your children and this and that. And, and I've got these letters. I'm reading them going, holy jeez, Renee, that's that's vicious. And John would write back saying, hey, Renee, um, do you still want to borrow those photos that we talked about 
last week on the phone. <laughs> like it just, it was just like water off of John's back. It was, it was bizarre. It was almost like an old married couple. So that was a bit shocking how much he hated Peter Byrne and tolerated Renee and Eric Beckjord. That was odd. Um, I was pleasantly surprised by all the photos John had. Photos of Bluff Creek, uh, Blue Creek Mountain, that whole investigation. Things of Bob Titmus, Even John going to Bella Coola with Bob Titmus, which I could you know relate to. Um, and then just photos from his investigations, his outings. He let me look at family photos. There's old film of him and his family together. That was that was uh, touching to see some of that stuff. Um, so I'm sitting on a lot of photos. Some of them make their way into videos that I put together. Um, yeah, it, it, that that really was touching to see that stuff because I, I literally cried a few times looking at some of that those those photos and reading the letters and slides and negatives. And, and the clearest photos, like the Bossberg stuff, clear as day that you've never seen. Because when it's in a book um, or a magazine, it's just, it's, I'm looking at the original, right? So, and, and like, I'm looking at the negative. So I'm looking at the original. Um, and then something that really surprised me, and, and I don't know if it shocked me, but pleasantly surprised, was there was always rumors about or talk about Roger never finishing his documentary. You know, the reason he went to Bluff Creek, because he was working on a documentary about Bigfoot. And everyone says, well, he never, the, the incomplete, unfinished documentary. So I, I believed it, because that's what people are saying. And you read about it in books, and people are talking about it. But then I caught wind of someone coming into possession of something that looked like Patterson's documentary. It was Russ Jones, Dr. Russ Jones. He had reached out to me and said, hey, Todd, I've got something here you might be interested in. It's like Roger interviewing people and, you know, some footage. And I thought, oh, I've seen that. You know, I've, I've got that stuff, not knowing what was being described. And so I said, yeah, that's cool. And he said, I think I'm going to, Russ said, I think I'm going to give it to um, um, the, the China Flats Museum um, because I think they should have it. Or, or, or maybe Patricia Patterson because it seems like it's property of theirs. And uh, he, he ultimately gave it to what's his name, Michael, he has the museum in, in, in California, you might know his name, can't remember his last name, anyways, he's uh, Michael Rugg, Michael Rugg, R-U-G-G, he passed it on to Michael Rugg, who, uh, who gave it to Patricia, but Russ kept some of the paperwork, and he's like, these are like receipts and stuff, and it's talking about showing the film here, and how much they got in ticket sales, so I'm kind of curious now, and Russ said, well, I'm going to bring it to Ohio for one of the Bigfoot conferences that's happening. I think it was a 2012 Bigfoot conference and uh, we're going to show it on the big screen. I'm like, well, geez, I got to see what this is. And I was going to the conference anyways. So I went to the conference and there they showed that he only had the first half of the documentary, but it, it's Roger Patterson's documentary made in 1968. I'm going, this thing exists. This is like the Holy grail. It's real. Um, uh, now, so we only have half of it, and now it's back in Patricia's hands. But a few copies float around because, you know, smartly, Russ made a few DVD copies, and I, I got one. Now, I'm at Beachfoot, 2014, Todd Neese's event, and there's a guy from, uh, I, I can't say too much, but there's a guy from the BBC. He's there, and he's doing um, a story on Bigfooters. And he and I, for some reason, we hit it off. We're both fans of the same bands. We got talking and we're like, oh my God, we're like brothers from another mother. Really hit it off. And I said, you work for the BBC. I need you to do me a favor. I need you to look up a film, a documentary that was done with Roger Patterson. And here's the name. See if you can find this. Because Patterson's documentary was done in tandem with the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation. Patterson didn't have the means to do it himself. And the BBC had uh, caught wind through Ivan Sanderson that Patterson was working on a documentary. And, of course, they were aware of the Patterson-Gimlin film. So they thought, hey, we've got maybe enough material to make a documentary. This is in 1968. So the BBC cut a deal with Roger where they would give some footage, send a camera crew over, uh, do some footage uh, for Roger. 
with the understanding that they could use the Patterson Gimlin film footage and Roger could use whatever they come back with for his purposes, but he couldn't, he couldn't release it um, on TV or, or make a movie, but he could show it in theaters. And that's when he connected Patterson connected with a guy named Ron Olson, who was with American national enterprises, a and E the first a and E and Olson and his twin brother, were fascinated with Bigfoot and they connected with Roger and Roger's brother-in-law, Al Diatli. And they started four walling um, what the BBC gave him. But, but first Patterson, he, he didn't like all of the BBC version uh, of the documentary because it was hosted by primatologist, Dr. John Napier and Napier was kind of sitting on the fence and in one breath, he'd say, you know, I don't see a zipper, but it can't be real. Because it walks like a man, but it has breasts. It just and 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 primates other than humans don't show uh, uh, breasts, you know, pendulous breasts. So this must be fake. But I don't see a zipper. So of course Patterson didn't want that. He wanted only the pro opinions to show in his version of the documentary. So he cut and paste, spliced um, his own, and he added some stuff too, including. A uh, whole long, boring monologue of his brother-in-law, L.D. Atley, introducing the film and talking about the organization because Patterson had an organization where you could mail in um, um, for, you, know, you send him three bucks and he'd give you like, you know, a membership to his his club. Um, <clears throat> and that that fell through and he didn't really, he had to, he had to refund mon money back on that. He lost money on that. But so that documentary, I, I, I I wanted to find the other half of it and I wanted to find both versions because Russ only had Roger's version. And I, I found out that there, that there was a BBC version and I asked this guy from the BBC, see if you can find it. It's gotta be somewhere. Now you may know that the, the British broadcasting corporation are famous, rather infamous for misfiling and losing stuff. They have a horrible system apparently. So a couple months go by and this guy who shall remain nameless because I think he still works for them and I don't want him to lose his job. He reaches out and says, Todd, I found it. It was, it was filed under Wildcat. <laughs> Wildcat? Are you serious? He's like, I'll, I'll, I'll burn a copy. It's, it's like on 16 mil. I'll burn a copy onto DVD and Bob's your uncle. You know, you got it. Just don't share it. Like, don't, don't share it. I'm like, okay, sure enough, it comes in the mail. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. It's the whole documentary, the BBC version that, as far as I know, hadn't aired on, on, since 1968. And and eventually, well, I shouldn't say eventually, he had sent me the, um, the worksheet with it that gave the information, when it aired, the length, who it starred, all, all the deets. And it aired on July 27th, 1968. And it only aired one time and it's about an hour long. And there were some names mentioned at the end of, you know, the credits at the end. So I tried to track down those people, all of whom had passed on except for one cameraman. So I, I connected with this cameraman and I talked to him and he was the guy in the U S he was American. And he, he did a lot of the, uh, the footage in, in Washington state and California and some of the interview stuff that shows up in the doc as well. So there, th th this documentary does exist. It's there. There's two different versions. I've got the British, uh, the BBC version up on my channel. Now I had to wait. I realized that I didn't have permission and I'd reached out to the BBC and they basically said, you can't do anything with it, pal. But then I did some investigation, got my lawyer involved and he did some investigation and he said, listen, there's, there's a copyright loophole in the UK. Basically, anything that airs on TV 50 years after the fact has no copyright anymore. Copyright's done. So I had to wait until 2018, 50 years before I could release it. And I think it was 2019 that I, that I made it public because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to get sued or something. So it's up on the Sasquatch Archives channel. It's called Amer uh, it's called Bigfoot, America's Abominable Snowman. Uh, you'll see the most footage of Roger Patterson ever. 
Um, you won't see his brother-in-law because it's the British Broadcasting Corporation version. Patterson's own version is shorter. That's the one he he took it around to theaters and schools uh, across uh, the Pacific Northwest back in 69 through 70 and early 71. And he took it as far as uh, Michigan State and showed it for a fee. And, and they made some money from it. There's no doubt they made some money from it. Um, and then Patterson got really sick uh, with uh, leukemia and didn't continue with that. Plus, they had basically saturated the market with it because honestly, by 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 those standards, it wasn't a good documentary. Even back in 68, 69, it wasn't a good documentary. Like as far as how it was put together, it was very low budget. By today's standards, it's amazing in, in so much as the history, historic value. Um, and I can appreciate that. I do have the full version of, of Patterson's own, but that that I can't really release that because it is copyright. Um, and I'd have to go through Patricia Patterson to get permission to, to, to release that. And she's not doing so well. And her son is looking after things and I haven't really been in touch with him. So if he's listening and he doesn't mind, I would love to, uh, to host that on the channel. People would love to see it. It is, it is different, uh, quite different than the BBC version, although quite similar as well. So that, I think to answer your question, Brian, I think that, that was probably the most shocking thing was that that documentary did get finished, does exist, toured around. And that documentary, a young 10-year-old Jeff Meldrum saw it um, in the theater. He saw it shown, and that's what really sparked, you know, someone who a lot of us look up to and, and, and uh, treat as the go-to scientist nowadays. So that, that, that documentary sparked his interest in the subject. So there you go. <laughs> That's a great story. That's one of the things that Dr. Mildum talked about when I had him on the show was how that sort of set him ablaze when it came to the Bigfoot subject and sent him down the path that he's been on for how many decades now. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this before you get out of here. Have you had personal experiences of your own when you've been out in the woods looking for these things? So um, I, I, I guess I'll say yes and no. I can't say with any certainty what I experienced or what was what was happening on the other side of the bushes, but I'll say that some interesting things have happened. Um, some things when I'm alone, but mostly with other people, which is great. Uh, for instance, a pretty intense bluff charge of something huge happened. Um, when I was alone, it happened and I had, I, I have a thermal imager. Uh, but anyways, whatever it was, was huge, big, and it came charging towards me twice, five minutes apart. Couldn't see it. I've seen bears on my thermal. I've seen deer on my thermal. Whatever it was, was able to hide behind something or, or below something. But it was freaky because I'd been doing a food drop for many months, uh, hoping to, you know, entice a Sasquatch into the area. And and I would do I would do a four whistle call in each direction. Four whistles south, four whistles north. I had like a, one of those gym, gym whistles, four east, four west to, to announce my arrival in, in the area. And I, and I would also do it when I dropped the food. And right after I dropped the food, blew my whistle, started walking back up the path, something came crashing at me like it was a tank. It was loud as you know what. And it freaked me out. I'm very comfortable in the woods, but whatever this was, it was angry. Like it was coming at me, and I thought it was a bear. But, you know, it takes a while to get the, 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 the fleur warmed up and stuff, and I finally get it on, and I can't see nothing. I'm thinking, that's weird because – Bears don't usually hide. I've seen bears with my thermal. Anyways, um, I'm thinking, well, maybe I imagined it because I don't see nothing. So I continue walking on the path, and it happened again. Maybe five minutes later, same exact thing. And but but the thermal was on and ready this time. Again, I couldn't see nothing, and I thought, okay, whatever's bluff charging me doesn't want me to be here. Let's get the heck out of here. So I started double stepping out of there and it's a mile back to my car. So it was a, it was a pretty, um, yeah, pretty freaky walk home, uh, walk back to my car. It was, it was unnerving, let's say, but anyways, I don't know what it was. Um, another time in that same area, uh, was with a, a buddy and there was this other lady that we just, she was just there walking her dogs. She had, she has two, three quarter wolves. So, so she needs to walk them in this, this forest so they don't eat other dogs. 
And we thought it was a wolf that approached us. And my buddy's like, dude, there's a wolf right there. And I'm like, holy shit, there's a wolf right there. And then we see this late, like we see a flashlight and, and we're thinking, Who, who's back here at three in the morning? We're, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. And so we call and this lady's like, oh, sorry, my dog's over there. Don't be alarmed. It looks like a wolf. It's just a three quarter wolf. Don't worry. So she comes over and talks to us and she, she tells us some stories that have happened this, in this forest. Cause we're, we're, she's curious. Why are you guys here? And we're curious. Why are you here? So she explained that she can only walk her dogs in this area, but she talks about a few things that were freaky that probably were related to Bigfoot, including finding a huge footprint, bare footprint, um, and her dogs cowering at her feet. Something was screaming and running towards her and her dogs cowered. These are big animals. They're three quarter wolves. They're huge, intimidating. She said they don't cower for nothing. These things were whimpering at her feet and they stayed there for three seconds and then they ran uh, away from her. And she thought, I better run too. So she doesn't know what it was, but something was crashing through the forest towards her, um, screaming. She said it sounded like a woman being knifed to death. And it was screaming at the top of his lungs. Anyways, so we're standing there talking to her. Her dogs are in the truck now, and they're growling. And she's like, well, don't worry. The dogs are just not comfortable with me talking to you. And then we hear something walking up a path. Oh, it's, it's completely dark. It's now 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. And my hearing's not that great because I'm a drummer. And my buddy says, Someone's walking up the path. Like, who else is out here? What's going on? And so we sort of stop and listen. And then something shakes a tree. And it was a huge tree. Just, it's a big tree. We went and looked at this tree. My buddy, he's a big dude. He could not, he and I could not move this tree. Whatever it was, shook the tree. Could have been a bear. The dogs are freaking out. Whatever it was, we heard it walk around, sort of circled us. And then it was gone. In that same area, heard wood knocks. Um, and then in Pennsylvania, we had rocks thrown at us uh, in an area that we know there's no one there. I, again, I had my thermal and uh, tw two nights we had rocks thrown at us. Uh, another time, I saw uh, what I can only describe as I, I glow, I shine, I glow. I was with two other people and I didn't know about I glow at the time. So I didn't make an association with Sasquatch or anything. Again, I don't know what it was, but it, it was definitely looked like eyes glowing. And it changed color from white to yellow, amber to orange, and then back. And it, the intensity, it was weird because the intensity changed. Um, and we don't know what it was, but it blinked. So we can only conclude it, they were eyes, but I don't know what was behind those eyes. Have I seen one? I saw a tuft of hair that may have been a Sasquatch. It happened very quickly. Um, it was in the daytime in Seashelt, which is Sunshine Coast, British Columbia. I was with my then girlfriend. And I don't know what it was, but it was freaky. And whatever it was, parted. Like it was swimming through berry brambles. You could see the brambles parting, which a bear couldn't do. Like they were parting, you know, 12 feet up in the air, basically. Uh, don't know what it was. Just saw it like, like a shoulder and it was gone. But that's pretty much it. I can't say with any certainty or conclusively I've seen a Sasquatch. Nope. I'm in the same boat with you, man. Todd Prescott. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your amazing archive of knowledge and everybody go over and check out the Sasquatch archives. I'll have it linked in the show notes. It is a, it's a place for anybody who's interested in anything Bigfoot. If you're into the history of this and people who made their way into this many, many years before any of us started doing any of the things we're doing, go check out the Sasquatch archives. Todd Prescott, thanks so much for joining us, man. I've had a blast talking to you. Thanks, Brian. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. They say you don't gotta go home, but you can't stay.